anyone ever supposed it lucky to be born? I hasten to inform him or her that it's just as lucky to die. And I know it. I've passed death with the dying and birth with the new washed babe, and I'm not contained between my hat and boot. Walt Whitman. And when I was growing up in Greenbrook, New Jersey, I hated poetry. If I had read something like that on the page, I wouldn't have understood it. And I felt like that for many, many years until finally one day I was living in New York City and the 72-year-old Broadway actress, this movie star, her name was Vivica Lindforce, she walked into my theater group in New York City and she performed that piece by Walt Whitman live. And for whatever reason, I felt it. I really, really felt it. And it was the first time that I had ever been impressed with the power of poetry, probably the first time I ever understood one. She went on to introduce my theater group to many other pieces, and we were so taken with her and with the words that she transformed my whole theater group into a guerrilla poetry troupe. She had each one of us memorize an hour's worth of poems of our own choosing that we then performed along with her throughout the streets of New York City. So at that time, I was in my early 20s. I had just dropped out of NYU. I was struggling to make it as an actress, sometimes months behind in my rent, dating a man who was 14 years older than me, who had another long distance girlfriend, I was trying to put a positive spin on all of this, but really felt very lost and alone, and I think probably struggled to keep from hating myself every single day. And somehow the words and the lives of these poets helped me. To me, their spirit seemed so alive. Walt Whitman says, Camarado, I give you my hand. I give you my love more precious than money. Shall we stick by each other as long as we live? And open your scarf shops while I blow grit within you. You shall not go down. And I didn't. In order to put together an hour's worth of poetry, I had to read a lot of books. And so I did anything I could get my hands on. And I ended up collecting a lot of poems and quotes and excerpts eventually amassing thousands. And I was struck by the fact that these classics weren't classics because they were old books. These classics were classics because they were great books. And the, the faces, the austere looking, um, mean, long beards of these people that I had always considered so foreign and just not very nice were really fronts actually, for the wild and renegade artists that they were inside. For example, Dostoevsky. I had heard that name in high school and definitely did not want to hang out with Dostoevsky. But when I started reading his work and learning about his life, it turns out that he was a gambler, he was a drinker, he was almost executed on a firing line by a firing squad until at the very last minute he got a pardon from the Tsar sent to Siberian prison for four years, which is where he said he learned to write. He said that the prisoners there that he met were his real brothers. And when he died, 40,000 people followed his tomb. And Tolstoy, <laughs> Tolstoy, author of War and Peace, Anna Karenina, the most intimidating books that any of us have probably ever even considered reading, he is Gandhi's hero, and he was excommunicated by the Pope because he wanted to teach peasants how to read. Walt Whitman, gay, beautiful, lonely Walt Whitman, in love of all humanity, especially real men. He said, I don't take my hat off for anybody, even the president. And he was the first person, the first poet ever to publicly celebrate his body as well as his spirit. He said, scent of these armpits, aroma finer than prayer. Zora Neale Hurston, loud laugh, life of the party, best friends with Langston Hughes until they had a falling out. She was a scholar, cultural anthropologist, folklorist who incorporated the dialogues, the dialects that she heard from the people around her into her work. 
She died penniless as a maid until the color of purples Alice Walker found her and put a tombstone on her unmarked grave and shy, eventual best-selling Emily Dickinson, who died with over 1,500 poems in her drawer. And I was so sad, so sad that I hadn't learned about the lives of these poets earlier. When I had been in high school, sitting in a chair, bored stiff for how many years, believing that all their words were only for the honors kids down the hall, when really, authors like Mark Twain, he sold his books door to door. Why? Because he wanted working class people to read them. And Tolstoy said, I am far more interested in ordinary people. For whom else do we write? And so, I fell in love with them. And I imagined them just dead, in their graves, clamoring, we need a new agent, meaning somebody to bring their words into the lives of the very people that maybe needed the most. And so I elected myself for the post. <laughs> and I wrote a, a, a one-person show about books called Deep Sea Diving. And in it, I played a lot of literary characters one of whom was the great Chicano poet, Jimmy Santiago Baca, who learned to read and write in maximum security prison. I typed him an email, will you come to my show? And <laughs> he did, actually, and eventually asked me to tour with him. Throughout the Southwest, we visited um, high schools, universities, gang prevention programs, and juvenile detention homes. And when we performed at these homes, the boys would sit, you know, really, really close to us. And then they would ask for our autographs when we were done and wave to us until we were out of sight. Some of these boys were just eight years old. And, you know, you wonder, what did they do to get in there? I ended up discovering that there is a real problem happening in America today with our youth. Right now, one out of three kids will drop out of high school. The majority of our African American and Latino boys drop out of high school with more living in prison than in college dorms. America has slipped to 20th place for college completion rates when we were once number one. And today, this is the first generation ever in U.S. history where our kids are slated to be less educated than their parents. So, in the book, in this, this, this report called To Read or Not to Read, um, a question of national consequence, the NEA chairman, Dana Joya, thought about this, and he discovered that American fifth graders actually compete really well against their international counterparts. But by high school, they lag far behind. A recent PISA study that came out just in December showed that American teen literacy ranked 17 of 34 nations. And the chairman goes on to say that this drop in scores occurs just as kids stop reading and teens spend 30, 40, 50 hours a week in front of screens. Computer, TV, video games. As American kids read less, they read less well. Because they read less well, they have lower levels of academic achievement. Thus, low reading scores are one of the greatest indicators of whether or not a child will finish high school. So then, you ask yourself, is the problem technology? No, you can't take back the clock, nor would we want to. Technology is, of course, not the enemy and has, in fact, just created a new bar for what's exciting and relevant and connecting and vital. But how do we create the same kind of excitement in the classroom? And how do we keep our kids reading? So after my 
tour with Jimmy ended, I wanted to continue working with teens. So I developed a program where I put together the classical recitation that I learned with Vivica with an idea to have teens respond to those classical pieces with their own spoken words. And I called this Get Lit. It, now, initially this was very popular amongst teenagers, but suspect amongst principals and teachers. Um, still, I went forth and I, I approached three Los Angeles County high schools. Uh, two of these schools had dropout rates of over 70%, and the one in South Central was frequently cited the worst school in the city. I brought this program in one day a week for 12 weeks. And when I started it in the South Central School, I asked on the first day I asked the kids to come into a circle. And they didn't. They just stared at me, like, really, a circle? <laughs> and then I said, um, I said, just drag them forward, it's fine. And once you get in the middle, once you get closer, in poetry we feel it's important to create a sacred space. So we don't want the children to be in the, in the seat that they normally are for regular school. We want to create an altered environment where they know that something new is about to happen. But they didn't move. Potential gangbangers nodding off in their chairs. One boy I touched really lightly on his arm and said, come on, he said, don't ever touch me again. So I thought, OK. Teacher staring at me, sweat starting to go down my face. And I had these pens in my bag, and I said, I have a magical pen in my bag, and this is guaranteed to make you a great writer. Whoever wants one of these pens, just pull your chair. Just pull your, just pull your chair right up here. And listen to, once you get here, listen to the poem and claim one. For whatever reason, I, I, I guess swag works with all of us, maybe, and teenagers included. They clamored for those pens. So I had a rush of chairs suddenly all around me, and they're ready. And so I said, OK, um, OK, of all the classrooms in all the schools that I could have been at today, I am here at yours. So maybe there's something in one of these poems that you're meant to hear. So if you hear something that means something to you, Raise your hand and claim it. Everybody's got to have their own piece. There's no repeat, so choose quickly. So normally, I would read the entire poem to the students in the class. But today, I'll just give you a little snapshot of what that was like. So it's a stack of papers. You pull one up, and it says, Dylan Thomas, do not go gentle into that good night. Old age should burn and rage at close of day. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. Edna St. Vincent Millay, I shall forget you presently, my dear, so make the most of this, your little day, your little month, your little half a year. Mary Oliver, you do not have to be good. You do not have to walk along your knees for miles through the desert repenting. You only need to let the soft animal of your body love what it loves. Tupac Shakur, please wake me when I'm free. I cannot bear captivity, or my culture I'm told holds no significance. I'll wither and die in ignorance, but my inner eye can see a race who reigned as kings in another place. The green of trees were rich and full, and every man spoke of beautiful. Miracle of all miracles, they raised their hands, fighting over Edna St. Vincent Millay in the schools of South Central, choosing Goethe as much as they chose Tupac, because they weren't choosing, choosing the poet necessarily that they had heard before but the one that spoke to their soul. This experience was exactly how I had felt way back with Vivica and proved that this was a universal experience. So over the course of the next 12 weeks, students memorized the poems that they claimed. They learned about the poet and the history of the time that it was written. They studied its vocabulary words, poetic form and devices, 
They listened to each other and learned about all the other poets in the class. And most terrifying of all, they learned to perform their piece in front of each other, going from this, has anyone supposed, wait, where's my paper? To this, has anyone supposed it lucky to be born? And then eventually, they, they got up the courage to write their own personal responses to those pieces, which they memorized and performed as well. So it's really simple, but also profound, because now you've got a 14-year-old girl named Annabelle from Watts, who has a relationship with a, girl, with a poet named Emily Dickinson, who's shy like her, who writes poems secretly like her, and she's performing her poem, I'm Nobody, Who Are You? Are you nobody too? Then there's a pair of us, don't tell. Everybody says she's really good when she performs it, and her mom makes her say it at Thanksgiving, and now she's got to write a response poem to this, to this piece, and she has to say it in front of her class. So she talks about her best friend, Markeisha, who died when she was 10. She rewrites it and rewrites it so it's good until finally the time comes for her to get up and say it in front of her class, and she's so scared. But she tells them through her poem how when Markeisha died, she was so sad. She wanted to die too. And afterwards, some kids from the class, they come up to her and they tell her that they also lost people that they loved. And for the first time ever, Annabelle doesn't feel alone. And now she can't wait to get to class each week. She loves poetry now. She's writing it all the time, and she's reading it all the time, too. And in this way, Getlet changes the student, the classroom, and the entire culture of a school. When you give a young person an opportunity for success, when a young person experiences a win, it causes a molecular shift, which changes their DNA. They go from one kind of a person to another, a potential statistic to a scholar. So what does it take for any of us to learn? What is it that happens? According to Zaretta Hammonds, the neuroscience of call and response, it's three things, three very simple things. One, paying attention. Telling students, pay attention, doesn't work. It's necessary to entice their brain with something that makes it emotional or curious, like one of these poems was meant for you today. Raise your hand and claim it. When a child's brain becomes curious, they listen in a whole new way. Second thing is remembering, firing and wiring. Over thousands of years, most oral indigenous cultures perfected long poems and rituals and rhyme schemes to preserve, their, to preserve their whole heritage. So it's in our genetic makeup, and we're wired to do so. You'll hear people, young people and all of us say, I can't remember something. But when our emotions are engaged, we can. Three, mirror neurons. The human brain contains mirror neurons that fire at the sight or sound of something relevant or emotionally charged. So we learn best in social context when our emotions are engaged and also the right side of our brain is activated. Normally, learning just engages the left side. But when the emotions come into play, we listen to something in a whole new way. Reading inspires. And in order for America to stay competitive in the global market, it is necessary for each and every one of our kids to read. And the best part is that America is not beyond hope. We rank 17th right now. Well, that can change. Poland, Poland changed in just three years. They went from the bottom to surpassing the United States in both reading and math. That wasn't easy, but it was possible. America can do the same, and we have to do it now. Paul Goodman, in his book, The Community of Scholars, talks about how in ancient societies, 
Young men were selected for scholarship at great institutions like the Sorbonne at 13 because they knew that between 13 and 19 the mind was most ripe for scholarship. But if we miss this window, we might be forever losing all of the scientists, inventors, doctors, engineers, artists, and educators that this country could and should be creating. How many millions of dollars are we spending imprisoning children rather than inspiring them? Today, what started in three schools has spread to high schools throughout Southern California, reaching over 20,000 teens and spreading to other cities, New York, Washington, D.C., Chicago. Get Lid and each and every one of the kids that we work with are living proof that out-of-the-box creative solutions to education work, and we invite you to be a part of the solution with us. Bring the power of poetry and literature into your communities so we can reach thousands and even millions of kids to change their lives and sometimes to save their lives. And by doing so, the world. Salman Rushdie says the poet's work is to name the unnameable, to point at frauds, take sides, start arguments, shape the world, and stop it from going to sleep. May the light inside our children's eyes stay forever lit. May they never outgrow the question, why? And may they know that knowledge and scholarship are not just meant for the kids down the hall, but for each and every one of them. Thank you.